Hello, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, our Lord, grant us grace so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys which thou hast prepared for them that unfeignedly love thee. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Rod him 472, verse 1. <clears throat> Hope of the world, thou Christ of great compassion, speak to our fearful hearts by conflict rent. Save us, thy people, from consuming passion, who by our own false hopes and aims are spent. Well, we return to our study of Thomas Cranmer's writings and letters uh, in this study and in the other one we're doing too we're looking for his doctrinal positions and I'm beginning to despair of hope with the biographers it's like systematics theology is not all that important and yet Cranmer did systematic theology Cranmer spent three years of just Bible studying the Bible. Well, everybody else to decide. Get rid of the library. Put the Bible down on the desk and study the text in Hebrew, Greek, Latin. And then he became a great advocate of the English Bible. And then he went back to studying the theology and the historians and the, the exegetes. He wasn't an anti-intellectual and a Bible-only man. Bible in the sense that it was supreme above all others, yes. Yes, 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 yes. He's a Bible man. But he didn't throw out the other voices in the history of the church, which we have already discussed in terms of our her hermeneutic elsewhere. But I pick up. Now, this is the beginning. It's uh, Edmund Cox's Volume 2. Volume 1 is... Cranmer's uh, writing on the sacrament. He was reformed. Okay. That we do know. <clears throat> I'm willing to guess a date of 1547, definitely before the 1549 prayer book. Uh, so all the Tractarians and their ubiquitarian friends uh, cannot read that book in the way that Tom intended it to be read. You can try. Stephen Gardner thought he could. Kind of stuck it in Tom's face. Tom cleaned it up so that there could be no misunderstandings in the 1552 book and the 42 articles. So bye-bye, Lutherans. Bye-bye, Ubiquitarians. Bye-bye, Tractarians. So we pick up where we left off. There are things that are missing in this biographical notice. He's going at lightning speed, and we're making some dates here. The huge thing was that we saw last time, very early date, 1534, hasn't even been in office a year. And a lot has happened, a lot of goofy stuff, stuff I, that we got to censure Cranmer for. But by 1534, he is pushing convocation and the king. Can we please get an English Bible? They may have burned John Wycliffe's ashes and thrown his ashes in the Severn River. But in the resurrection, John Wycliffe and Tom Cranmer, they're going to be good friends. Boy, won't it be great to meet those men? We're beginning to think of eschatology, too. Uh, that came up in some earlier studies and in morning prayer with Job and Satan and God. And we were talking about metaphysics, and this doesn't get enough stress. The next world, eschatology or the metaphysics of just God's being and Satan's being. I've never heard a sermon on Satan. References to him, but not per se. So, anyways, I'm diverging. 1534 was a huge thing that he claimed, Professor Cox, and I'm inclined to really agree with him, but Cranmer had that in his mind, 1534. 1532, when he was at Nuremberg as an ambassador, and he had a little secret meetings <laughs> with Pastor Osiander, and then married his niece. Before he came back, he was impressed by 
the vernacular reading of the Bible in the Nuremberg Church, which tells you he went to church in a Protestant city, a Lutheran city. And he went in with just one man and he dressed, he got into regular dress instead of the ambassadorial robes to the imperial court. And he secretly went in. <laughs> Tom was not an artless fellow. He was diplomatic. Uh, the biographers would call him naive and timid. And, uh, we've thrown that overboard. We're willing to suspend or have the judgment appealed and listen to the appeal, but the lower court has ruled that Tom was not a naive bumpkin. Or as one biographer said, he's as artless as a child. <laughs> That's just play. But it's good comedy. You know, read those guys having a good laugh. Not so much. Um, it's because of what they say that we laugh. That's why we, we're learning a lot about the historians as well as Cranmer. Watch silly things being said, but Cox is not one of them, nor is Jasper Ridley. The state of religion at this moment throughout the country was unsettled. This is following Henry's death, January 28, 1547, which hitherto had been unsuccessful in his F. Oh, wait. Um, where was I here? The country was unsettled, and it was evident to himself that he was entering upon a reign which, in its earlier period, could not fail to increase his anxiety and cares. And let's skip back into Tom Cranmer's stand beside him and listening to him and watching as he realizes, remember Anne Askew was burned in 1546, so he didn't mention that. Cranmer, I think he had a, a love for Henry VIII and vice versa. I think uh, it's the it's almost the craziest thing how Cranmer got away with what he believed and yet never went to the fires. Um, I think only Cranmer could get away with talking that way to Henry. And Henry had some kind of deep bond with Cranmer and trusted him and respected his integrity and his gravity. There's something in that relationship that's Peculiar and special. I can't describe it in any other way than that. But Cranmer, that's when he began growing his beard, as, so he says, uh, in memory of Henry VIII. That may be a nice euphemism or another way of saying, and now I'm reformed. Because that was the way that reformed men distinguished themselves from papist priests. Papist priests would shave. They were clean shaven. You look at pictures of Stephen Gardner. You look at Tom Cranmer before the death of Henry, and he's clean shaven in that 1545 flick picture. When Henry dies, he begins growing his beard, and I think he did it to identify with the Reformed faith. Yes, in memory of Henry, but also a little the unspoken thing, but no. I can come out of the woods. I really think that's what was going on. I'd love to ask Ashley No, but I don't know where it's at. So we stand next to Tom, and Henry has died, and he's got to be involved with the funerals, the archbishop. And he sees the young lad, Edward VI, coming. And he can see turmoil. He knows the Council of Trent has started. He knows there's a counter-reformation brewing. He sees the stuff that's gone on between the Lutherans and the Romanists on the continent. Luther has died in 1546. Calvin's still, he's in Geneva, and he's laboring away. <clears throat> so standing alongside Cram, he's got to have some anxiety. Where are we going here? What do we do next? Edward VI was but 10 years old when he began to reign, and as much as of the affairs of state necessarily fell to the charge of the archbishop, 
he had to encounter unceasing opposition of the men who throughout the later years of the late king's government had never ceased to harass and persecute him. Gardner, our good old buddy Steve of Winchester, Bishop of Winchester, since 1531, so he's been in office for 16 years in the second richest diocese in England, the previous seat of King Alfred the Great. And part of Alfred the Great's chapel is still in Winchester. Or part of the walls are there. Gardner still continued his activity, although separated from the government. Cranmer was an aide was enabled to set his machinations at defiance by prosecuting steadily the object he had in view. And in order to ascertain the actual condition of the church, he obtained a royal proclamation for a visitation of the whole kingdom. And by visitation, that means I get to ask hard questions, theological questions, and he was the man to ask them. You're not like Justin Welby with no theology. Cranmer had a theology. Now, admittedly, he had to go into the service of Henry VIII and have his time chewed up by serving that guy. He should have stayed at Cambridge, in my estimation. He'd sit around, read books, study, talk to people, influence the younger guys. But he's been chosen archbishop, and God, in his sovereignty, has elected him so that he could ascertain the actual condition of the church. It's a very scholarly thing to do, not surprising. That's Cranmer. He obtained a royal proclamation. You know Steve Gardner's got to be choking 60, 70 miles southwest of London, which measure was resolved upon in April and carried into effect in the following September. Here we go. Buckle up, friends. The Reformation was now progressing, and the Archbishop's influence became more and more predominant, especially in the deliberations of the clergy. He's the man. He's on the front lines now. On November 22, this must have been 1547. This is where these guys need to, I guess they need to teach as an editor. It's got to be 1547, within 11 months of the death of Henry. He produced an ordinance for the receiving of the sacrament in both kinds. Huge. That's a very Lutheran thing to do. He was it unanimously carried and immediately afterwards obtained an entire repeal of the six acts. Huge. He didn't like the six articles, but he, he did he go on rig for ultra deep in 1539. Latimer and Shaxton bugged out, gave up their bishoprics. Shaxton later recanted and then became a persecuting Romanist, is, is my understanding. Lat Latimer, who graduated the, near the top of his class at Cambridge, while Cranmer graduated down in the bottom third. I don't know what the backstory is on that. But the six articles goes down the tubes in November 1547. That was the pro papist deal, and that's if Cranmer had the. This is 1539. You know he's got Margaret and kids <laughs> shifting around from palace to palace. I think Tom had six or seven archiepiscopal palaces. You know he's. He had to send her off to Germany. It's terrible with the kids. So the six articles are gone. The persecuting statutes are gone, an abrogation of which hitherto he'd been not able to procure. This year, 1548, the abolition of images, uh oh, and steps for the converting the mass into a communion service in English. Opposition was offered to these proposed changes, but the tide now had set in favor of the progress of the Reformation. And, you know, let's stop for a minute, brothers and sisters. 
uh, Luther was able to sit in the town, the city of Wittenberg, and deal with the provincial head of that of Saxony. Calvin's in Geneva. It's a city. He's just got to work with the syndics of Geneva. He doesn't have a nation. Cranmer's up against Parliament, a big old bench of Episcopal bishops sitting in the House of Lords. He's got kings. He's got 10,000 churches. We can praise him that we got anything done out of that, out of that place. So you see, Kelvin had the ability to maneuver more. Calvin did what a good scholar should be doing. He wrote 22 books on the Old Testament, wrote 12 on the New Testament, wrote the, you know, he's a scholar. And we're enriched. The church has been enriched by Calvin. He wasn't perfect either. We don't exalt Calvin. We love him. Best, one of the best of the best then and today. We're enjoying working with him on Luke. Genesis, we're in Genesis 2 now, and he uses the Greek and the Hebrew and the Latin. That's what I think Cranmer should have been doing up at Cambridge, writing books. But he's in government, <coughs> and he blooms where he can. No images, he's getting ready, 1548, he's thinking ahead, communion service. This is in his mind as he's living at Lambeth. We're not sure when Peter Vermiglii comes down there to help him at Lambeth and as his table companion. Uh, and he, he did also bring uh, Margaret, his wife, back from Germany. And she was able to live openly as his wife. Opposition was offered. Um, he undertook the work of producing the English liturgy, litany that was finished received the final sanction of the legislature on 15 January 1549. You know, if you don't know a lot about Cranmer and, you know, you're tuning in and you're listening, I think we see a man with loyalty to the Bible and loyalty to the churches and a man who goes as fast as he can or is allowed to go. He's got a lot of forces against him. So we got 15 January, 1549, the month before that, exactly almost a month before, 14 to 18 December, 1548, just as the year's turning, he gave an ardent sermon in the House of Lords, almost two hours long. And he argued in a scholarly way, compelling, vigorous way for the reformed view of the Eucharist. Will somebody give uh, Bob Duncan a call? Hey, Bob, do you ever hear this? Or Jack down there in uh, Fort Worth, you and your ubiquitarian buddies. You ever think about Cranmer's two-hour sermon in the House of Lords before the prayer book? Bye-bye, Wittenberg. Bye-bye, Lutherans. Hello, Geneva and Zurich. It's beginning to be understood in academic circles. They know it. There's a shift. And the historians are, yeah, they're beginning. Yeah, okay. But they'll say, well, it doesn't really matter. But then you turn around, they're doing all kinds of bowings and scrapings and elevations of the host. They don't even know why they're doing it. And then they'll plead like one of my rectors he just passed away, by the way. He just said, I don't know what to do about the presence of the Lord and the sacraments. It's not for me to know. Kind of like Elizabeth. Well, that wasn't Cranmer's view. And Bartholomew Traheron wrote some of the Zurich reformers afterwards and said, you know, Tom's got a, he's viewed as kind of tepid and lukewarm. He wasn't a rash man. But they said after that lecture in the House of Lords, that was that. He came out in an academic way. And when we get to the confutation of unwritten verities, which is what I want to get to ultimately uh, after this bio notice, uh, showing us his doctrine of scripture, he was known to be a man who just basically won 
kind of dropped a 2,000 pound bomb off of an F-18 in an aerial dive, target on or ordnance on target, ba boom. That was 14 to 18 December, 1548, and then January 15, 1549, the prayer book is authorized. English, huge, just huge, to go from Latin to English. You know, if Wycliffe had been alive, his head would have been spinning right off in joy. We don't realize that because we were in the 21st century. We've got English Bibles all over. I got all kinds of them over here. Hallelujah. But to stand back there and see how oppressive and in fact, criminal. Yes, I'm really seriously thinking about the criminal statutes in Boyce's and Perkins' criminal law book. Once we finish the law of homicides that I think Tom's involved in as a as an accessory to the fact of first degree homicide. I think we need to in time get to burglary, theft, receiving stolen possessions, and go through the statutes and think legally because the Roman Catholic Church stole the Bible from their people. They stole it. Now, even as I was a kid, the church across from our home church, George Brendan attended there. My school buddy, Roman Catholic, his dad was a tank commander in Patton's army, Romanist. George Derricks, I'm sorry, George Derricks, if he's still alive or not. He'd come out, I remember going over there and and the Latin mass was going on after our church would stand on the narthex and wait for George to come out. And man, it was mysterious. Latin going on and everything was dark and the candles were lit. Big deal to go from Latin to English. And that's a major, as is Lutheran and Reformed, were for vernacular Bibles. And as you know, Tyndale died <coughs> about 12 years before this. The spirit of rebellion was, however, abroad. Okay, we're probably going to get into the Devonshire Rebellion. <coughs> yeah, he is. And while the vast proportion of inhabitants of the country rejoiced at the changes were taking place, I'm not sure about that, but the Devonshire and Cornwall active opposition was roused by the disaffected and a formidable revolt broke out, which ended in the signal defeat of the rebels. The part which the archbishop had to take in these events was of a prominent character, and his answer to the demands of the rebels remains as an important and interesting document among his many literary labors. And Dr. Torrance Kirby emphatically holds that Peter Vermiglii wrote the response to the rebels down in the Devonshire that's way down on the channel in the southwest. And that Cranmer took it and translated it almost verbatim, word for word, from the Latin. Uh, Verbegli never learned English when he came to England. And he had to talk Latin to Cranmer, and they both were able to get by. Vermigli had a real hand in Cranmer's thinking on the sacrament, on double predestination. <laughs> and in the prayer book, and then also in writing the stiff response to this rebellion down south, really probably act energized by and led by uh, some Latinist priests. In the month of December of the same year, which year? 1549? An act passed the legislature authorizing the marriage of clergy, which afterwards, AD 52, was confirmed by declaratory statute that marriages performed under it were valid. From the year 1549 to 51, the work of reformation still proceeded, quote, 
the labor of the most reverend Archbishop of Canterbury, close quote, writes Peter Vermiglie to Bullinger, January 27, 1550. And we're doing a study of the Swiss Reformation with John T. McNeil in another series. Is not to be expressed for whatsoever has hitherto been wrested from them, the bishops, we have acquired solely by the industry and activity and importunity of this prelate. Really giving high praise. In this year, 1550, was the burning of Joan Bocher in the biographical notice prefixed to the writings of Roger Hutchinson published by the Parker Society. There is a statement relieving the Archbishop from the allegation respecting her case so commonly reported to his prejudice. We'll have to assess that. So we've got Vermiglie giving high praise as a scholarly former, I think he was Augustinian, abbot in Naples, from Naples, chased out of there by the papists. He obtained orders for the abolition of popish books of devotion. <laughs> That's not going to go down well. And effected the completion of the formulary for the ordination of clergy. This is a, we're going to have to end it here. There's a lot going on here. Because we're looking at the, the reformists. This is, we're going to the mens rea. Cranmer, what is he thinking? What does he believe? He's now out in the open. Vermigli, he's out in the open. The papist bishops got to be angry. We want to get on the streets of London and at Lambeth Palace. because It's not going to last long. And we'll see what his mind was that he was not able to do under Henry. Uh, let's pause for prayer. Almighty God, somehow, some way, may we learn things from this story of your saint, Thomas Cranmer. We may be thankful for his prayer book, thankful for his loyalty in, in difficult times, and ultimately for his final witness in death. This and anything else you shall see to be necessary, we ask in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll be back in a few days, God willing. Until then, Godspeed.